I'm going to speak very briefly as an introduction so that Professor Visker will have more time. Uh, and uh, I think the flyer says uh, most of the things that need to be said about him. He's a professor at the Institute of Philosophy at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, but what I, what I would like to add that's not there is that uh, this is Professor Visker's third visit to BYU. He's a great friend of the university, I believe, as well as a great personal friend. He's a person of great erudition and an entertaining speaker. I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. Uh, I highly recommend that you take a look at the, we're sending a flyer around about books that have just recently been published, and there are some available. Uh, the flyers are available outside, I believe, if you wish to take a look at them on your way out. And uh, so I give you Professor Visker and ask you to pay attention. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I would especially like to thank the Center for its hospitality in inviting me to give this lecture under a title that I hoped would puzzle you. And uh, you will have to bear with me because I'm not going to explain the title immediately. I'm just going to the first part of my paper has to do with the remarkable fact that I, as a philosopher, I'm going to talk about psychoanalysis. This is the first time ever, and uh, perhaps it won't be repeated, the, because it is not evident to do that. The, if there is one thing, one thing that really singles out recent contemporary continental philosophy, it is a shift in its position toward psychoanalytic themes. And this shift in the position has to do with the shift in philosophy itself. Philosophy has turned from a focus on the subject to a focus on the other, or on what links the subject to the other, on intersubjectivity. Hence, the popularity of expressions like the other, but also the other in me, yes? Whenever there is a positive mention of the self, it is when this self is sort of accompanied by another that somehow seems to liberate it from the burden of being a self. And hence, instead of, uh, there seems to be a kind of immediate solidarity between this theme of the other in philosophy and the theme of the other in psychoanalysis, the other, the foreign, the unconscious, etc. If you look at this, this is a presumption, yes? It's almost a prejudgment. It seems as if, if you make these assumptions, no one will question them. And in the first half of my paper, I will exactly question these, yes? Instead of remaining hostile or allergic to Freudian thought, as philosophy used to be, contemporary philosophy seems to welcome Freudian thought. And to the point of no longer being shocked by what once shocked philosophy in Freud. And what once shocked philosophy in Freud was the attempt to think an unconsciousness that would not be derived from consciousness. Yes, An unconsciousness that instead would force one to rethink consciousness itself. And traditional philosophers, like Sartre, for example, protested just that move. And in contradistinction, contemporary philosophers seem to find in that move just the ammunition they need to further dethrone the subject from its once privileged position. One enthusiastically quotes Freud's, the I is no master in its own house, in one breath, with Nietzsche's man is riding the back of a tiger, to triumphantly conclude that the subject is a mirage one no longer has to believe in. A conclusion which I suspect would to psychoanalytic ears, and I'm no psychoanalyst, but many of my friends are, yes, betray but another resistance, yes, as if the truth would now come from the id, from the s. And as if the yoke from which we knew, would need to emancipate us would be the ego or the superego, or in terms of Freud's first topology, as if consciousness would now be the obstacle 
that prevents the unconscious from exercising its liberating and therapeutic force. Now, I'm going to focus on a passage from a well-known author, highly respected, who is both an analyst and a philosopher. And that passage seems to exemplify exactly that shift which I talked about. Let me give you the quote first before I give you the name. Yes, it's a better. Since Freud, I quote, since Freud discovered the deadly and erotic unconscious, the uncanny strangeness, Freud's Unheimlichkeit, yes, places the difference in us and points toward it as the ultimate condition for our coexistence with others. This is a quote from the end of a book that is called The <coughs> Strangers to Ourselves, yes, from Julia Kristeva, who is indeed an analyst and a philosopher. And she continues, if we recognize this uncanny strangeness in ourselves, we will no longer let the strangeness outside of us affect us with either joy or grief. The strange or the foreign or the other is in me, and hence we are all strangers or foreigners. And Kristeva concludes that the ethics of psychoanalysis, which she has just outlined, has, I quote, political consequences at stake, she says, is a new kind of cosmopolitanism that, cutting across governments, economies, and markets, is directed toward the world in which human solidarity is based on the consciousness of the unconscious that desires and destroys, that is anxious, void, and impossible to handle. Now, don't worry, I'm going to comment on this quote. I'm going to unpack this quote. I disagree. Yes, I disagree, and I think it's a typical example of how a psychoanalytic theme is once more put to service of a philosophical theme that it is really incompatible with. On a charitable reading, what Kristeva is actually saying here is that a subject should learn to accept the strangeness or the foreignness that it experiences in itself so that it can also accept the foreignness it is confronted with from the outside. It's not a minor thesis in a Europe that actually faces the problem of racism, immigration, multiculturalism, fundamentalism, etc. This acceptance is at the core of the psychoanalytic ethics Kristeva has in mind. An ethics in which she sees a cure for the tendency to blame others for what from her point of view, they cannot and ought not to be blamed. For the subject is split within itself. It bears the other or the foreign or the strange in itself. And this split is accordingly not something that others inflict upon it. And that could be eliminated by eliminating these others. In other words, the irritation we feel toward the strangeness outside of us, so what one calls the problem of the immigrants or the foreigners, is, according to Kristeva, but the flip side of our incapacity to recognize our own condition, the strangeness or the foreigners in ourselves. Inversely, solidarity with the foreigner presupposes that we would admit or allow the foreign within ourselves. Instead of closing ourselves off from the other in us, we should open ourselves to what is other in us, foreign in us, strange in us, to our unconscious. And by thus opening ourselves, we would be able to overcome the very borders that divide humanity into natives and strangers, into autochthonous and allochthonous. And hence, her central statement, if I am a stranger to myself, there are no longer any strangers. 
I comment. What she's saying here is that the foreign in us apparently has the capacity to give birth both to what is best and to what is worst in us. It seems all to depend on how we react to it, whether we react to it with a flexible acceptance or with a crispate attempt to ward it off. And the problem with this reasoning, it seems to me, is its premise. For why would the foreign within me be in harmony with the foreign of the other or with the foreign within the other? Why would the mutual contact between these two instances of the foreign lead to solidarity and not, for example, to fratricide? And what guarantee do we have that even the foreign which I recognize in myself would be content with that recognition? Let me explain. What I mean is when one uses expressions like the foreign within me, and contemporary philosophy is full of these expressions. Let me repeat, yes, the other, the other within me. When one uses these expressions, one reasons as if the within is self-evidently guaranteed. As if that is, there would be a border between the foreign and the self or the me, a border that prevents the foreign from invading that self or that me, yes? And eventually from destroying it. So the other in the self could, why wouldn't it destroy the self, invade the self? Why do we trust, why do we immediately trust an expression like that? In other words, one presupposes, when one uses these expressions, that the relation between the foreign and the self would be one of mutual respect. The other within me respects the borders that assign it just a kind of place that is signaled by the word within, a kind of inner extraterritoriality. Now, this is surely an all but evident assumption to make, especially when one bears in mind that when someone like Kristeva is talking about the foreign or the strange, what she means is the unconscious, and of which we heard her state herself, that this unconscious is anxious, wild, and unmanageable. But in other words, Freud's uncanniness, uh, which Kristeva renders as old French authors as inquietant étrangeté, so worrying foreignness, yes. Freud's uncanniness, its discomforting strangeness, seems to have become, under the pen of Kristeva, surprisingly canny, surprisingly comfortable, almost homey. <laughs> Uncanniness gets, as it were, a homeopathic function. The uncanny difference in us becomes a precondition for us living with difference outside of us, we heard her say. As if Freud did not remark that the prefix un in uncanny was the token of repression. This is a quote by Freud. The uncanny Freud had learned from Schelling concerns just those situations where something that ought to have remained hidden and secret comes to light. In other words, those situations in which what is repressed returns, which means in which repression has been unsuccessful and the barrier that is supposed to uphold such repression is effaced. Freud uses the term effaced, verwischt. What is so discomforting about the strangeness Freud is talking about is that a border is no longer operative and that thus something comes to the fore which was not meant to show itself. What was meant to remain private suddenly appears in public. And instead of feeling solidarity, as Kristeva implies, what Freud says we are experiencing is an unease, a discomfort. We feel awkward, 
and we react to the uncanny, to the foreign, with a mild anxiety. And this is just a summary of Freud's essay that you probably all have read, Das Unheimliche, the Uncanny. It's one of Freud's most accessible essays. And I think one can safely conclude from this summary that it is all but evident on what basis exactly Kristeva wants to erect her cosmopolitan ethics. Kristeva or anyone else who puts this enormous faith in expressions like the other in the self. For it seems to me that there is the following alternative. Either the foreign respects the borders that assigned a, it a place within me, but this means that repression is successful and that there is no uncanniness at all. Or there is an uncanniness and, <coughs> sorry, there is an uncanniness but that means that the foreign has invaded the self. And it is all but clear why it would then stop at a certain point of this invasion and in its turn assign an enclave to the self instead of simply destroying it. So in other words, what Kristeva and others who use that expression, and I used it myself many years ago, what need for her argument to work is a distinction between what I would call a good other and a bad other in the self. Where the word good would refers not only to what is good for me, but also good for the other outside of me, the other capital O, the other human being. As such a good other would, is an other that would bring me to open myself up to the other outside of me and would perhaps even bring me to, sa to sacrifice my self-interest to that other's well-being. Now, there is at least one contemporary philosopher who has construed the system around such a notion of a good other in me, an other in me that can change me without crushing me. That philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, has also pointed out the price one needs to pay for the introduction of such a good other. He calls such a good other the soul. Yeah? The other in me is explicitly called the soul. And the soul means that before the subject is tied and vowed to itself, it is tied and vowed to the other. Yes? And then, of course, you can understand that the other in me, the soul, opens me up toward the other. But that argument about which I'm not going to, which I'm not going to further develop, but which you find developed in the volume on the leaflet, that argument in turn makes, as Levinas explicitly says, notions like God and creation necessary. And there is no mention of these notions in Kristeva nor are these notions mentioned and worked out in a lot of authors who use the expression, the other in me. And they certainly don't inspire Freud. Which brings me to my second point, which will be a short one, before I come to reveal the title secret, minor differences. Yeah? Namely, Freud's anti-cosmopolitanism. For all I know, there is nothing in Freud's text that would favor the cosmopolitan ethics that Kristeva advocates. To the contrary, there are many passages that work against it. Let me just remind you of those pages in Civilization and its discontents in which Freud sees in the command to love thy neighbor, and I quote, an excellent example of the unpsychological proceedings of the cultural superego. For, says Freud, this command goes against human nature. It issues a command and he does not ask whether it is possible for people to obey it. I quote, the superego does not trouble itself enough about the facts of the mental constitution of human beings. And as for these facts, Freud is Hobbesian. He quotes Plautus, man is, ma man is a wolf for man. For Freud, 
I quote, men are not gentle creatures who want to be loved and who at most can defend themselves if they are attacked. To the contrary, Freud writes, they are creatures amongst whom intellectual endowments is to be reckoned a powerful share of aggressiveness. And he even goes on to quote Highness, one must, it is true, forgive one's enemies, but not before they have been hanged. <laughs> Freud does not doubt that a foreigner who does not respect what to him is strange or foreign about me is in his turn, I quote, unworthy of my love. Worse, I quote, he has more claim to my hostility and even to my hatred. And so Freud's message clearly seems to be the inverse of Kristeva's and the inverse of the one that Kristeva attributes to psychoanalysis. What Freud is saying that culture can attempt to restrict human aggressiveness, but it cannot eliminate it. If it denies such aggressiveness, it will turn against the individual subject and make it unhappy. The command to love one's neighbor as oneself rests on an assumption which Freud does not hesitate to call, I quote, a mistake. It assumes, he says, that a man's ego is psychologically capable of anything that is required of it, that his ego has unlimited capacity over his id, his s, yes? Quote, even in what are known as normal people, the id, the s, cannot be controlled beyond certain limits. If more is demanded of a person, a revolt will be produced in him, or a neurosis, or he will be made unhappy, end quote. Well, I think that it would be wrong to conclude from this preliminary picture that the different attitudes towards the foreigner one finds in Freud and Kristeva are merely the consequences of their different views on man. That's always easily said. Yeah? For example, Freud's naturalistic sobriety versus Kristeva's Rousseauistic optimism, which would be behind her belief in the natural goodness of man. For I think it would be a mistake, and a very often made mistake, to call Freud simply a naturalist. As one of my teachers remarked, Freud did not naturalize man, he rather humanized nature in man. Hence, the, what Freud calls trip, the drive, is not an instinct, but something between the somatic and the psychic, a third. Yeah? Which is no doubt the reason why Freud, who is the author of a piece called Drives and Their Vicissitudes, Triebe und Triebschicksale, was so interested in Greek tragedy. For the fate of a tragic hero is not, about, is not someone who can be found guilty or unguilty. Remember Oedipus. Oedipus realized his fate by trying to escape it. Was Oedipus guilty? guilty? Was he unguilty? If there is any ethics to be found here, it will be a tragic ethics instead of a cosmopolitan ethics. A tragic ethics that takes into account human finitude. It is that finitude which Freud wanted to bring out by focusing on the unconscious. For the unconscious confronts us with a kind of paradox. It works behind my back, and yet it comes from me. It seems to be something that just happens, and yet it is not foreign to me. Perhaps one could do justice to that paradox by saying, I am not unresponsible for it. That is, I am not uninvolved. Now, in the rest of this lecture, I would like to bring this preliminary disagreement between Freud and Kristeva into further relief by connecting Freud's exploration of the uncanny to a number of his remarks on the narcissism of minor differences, my title, yes? My aim will be to show that the psychoanalytic conception of the relation between the foreign and the own cannot be rendered as it has been until now by the simple in or within, the foreign in or within the self. Instead of introducing an other in the self, I think that psychoanalysis rather points to the otherness of the self. 
to it being foreign to itself in a sense that it can be both strange and related to itself. Lacan, not Lucan, eh? Lacan coined a nice expression for that. Lacan speaks of an extimacy, and that's a neologism, a neologism which he derived, of course, from intimacy, which itself is the superlative of the word intimus, like in Augustine's intimior, intimo, meo. Yes. I would like to show how Freud's minor differences can be understood through such extremism. Let me tell you what is meant by minor differences first. Freud introduced that term to point to the phenomenon that it is precisely communities with adjoining territories and related to each other, in other ways as well, who are engaged in constant strife and in ridiculing each other, like the Spaniards and the Portuguese, for instance, or the Northern and the Southern Germans, or the English and the Scottish, or the Flemish and the Dutch. Yeah. Freud sees in this phenomenon, I quote, a convenient and relatively harmless satisfaction of the inclination to aggressiveness, by means of which cohesion between the members of a community is made easier. It is always possible, Freud writes, I quote, to bind together a considerable number of people in law so long as there are other people left over to receive the manifestations of their aggressiveness, end of quote. An anti-cosmopolitan statement, if there ever was one. I quote again, the advantage which a comparatively small cultural group offers of allowing this instinct an outlet in the form of hostility against intruders is not to be despised, end quote. Now, an example of this phenomenon, Mr. Chairman, that immediately comes to mind is exactly the European Union. The more it gets united, the more it gets divided by all sorts of particularisms that resist such unification and that defend their differences, no matter how small and negligible they are. Think, for example, of the Serbs and the Croats, Croats in former Yugoslavia. The differences between their languages, for example, were once small enough to allow for a Serbo-Croatian English dictionary. Yes. Whereas now, these differences are blown up and there are separate different dictionaries. So it's clear that one can think of examples of these minor differences. But why does Freud link this term to narcissism? And when's that omnipresent appeal to an aggressiveness that as such is never really explained? Why is that drive toward aggression triggered rather by minor than by big differences. Closed in in itself. And that only gradually opens to reality and only gradually leaves its protective cocoon or shield. The movement in Freud is thus from the inside to the outside. Ego decatects energy and invests it outside, yes? Now, Lacan, in his famous Rome discourse, the very famous uh, paper on the mirror stage, yes, starts from the exact inverse hypothesis. Narcissism is connected to a movement from the outside to the inside. Yes. Unity, that is, is introduced in the self from the outside. Let me try to explain. I'm not an analyst. This is how I understand Lacan. The child, says Lacan, and he's basing this argument on psychological studies by Vallon and others, the child finds its ego in and through the other, by which he means it is the body of the other child or the child's own mirror image that is perceived as the gestalt in which it finds something it does itself not yet have at this stage, namely 
motoric control, unity. One cannot state in a sense that the child recognizes itself in the other, for it seems that it's only through that other that the child comes to a kind of self. Identity, selfhood, would thus be the result of some sort of identification without subject. Lacan and Wallon describe the situation of an infant uh, before a mirror on the arms of his mother, etc., and suddenly there is a jubilation. Yes? It's, and he turns to the mother, and the mother says, or the father, yes, that's you, that's you. Yeah? And that behavior, apparently, according to the studies by Vallon, you don't find in chimps, for example. A chimp will be interested for a very little while in its mirror image and then look behind the mirror. Yes? But a li a, an infant is captivated by its mirror image. And so you should imagine this infant as it, it, it has no motoric control, but of course the, the mirror image seems to have control, or another child seems to have a unity, yes? Okay. So the subject that results from this identification without subject finds itself in an impasse that is both structural and that gives it its structure. Since it only reaches itself through the other, it needs that other, for it is the other self that comes to model itself, yes? But for the same reason, that other constitutes an obstacle for it to reach the unity that it desires. It wants to fall together with itself, yeah? But since it only comes to itself through another, the other is both necessary and an obstacle. To put this differently, identity will always bear the trace of an exteriority that it cannot fully interiorize. This would be, if you want, a Derridian way of putting it. I am another means, so this is Lacan's famous statement, je et un autre, which he takes from Rimbaud, and he quotes that in that text. I am another means I cannot do without that other through whom I get an eye. Yes? That other becomes someone that I cannot expel which means that my alienation is original, for it is implied in my self-constitution. There is no selfhood without foreignhood, without strangeness. The self is then not something I possess, it is because it is irremediably linked or infected with an otherness that prevents it from being fully at one with itself. Now, if you find this heavy, very simple example of this is what happens in jealousy. Anyone can recognize this. Someone who is jealous is all the time talking about someone else of whom the jealous person claims that he is less than nothing, that he doesn't deserve, etc. So the famous paradox then, why are you so preoccupied? Why are you always talking about that person? There is this movie about uh, a woman who imitates another woman up to the point of dressing like her, going to the same hairdresser, and even sleeping with that woman's boyfriend, or attempting to sleep with that woman's boyfriend. Yeah? She becomes a perfect double of the other, yes, which she then, in the end, kills. And the result is, predictably, that she herself collapses. She needs the other. Yeah? to admire, and at the same time, she wants to eliminate the other. Yes? So the other has something attractive, but precisely because it's to that other that I model myself, I can only really become at one with myself if the other wouldn't be there. So it's a vicious circle. One finds the same sort of ambivalence in our reaction to strangers. What do people say about strangers? They are too lazy to do anything. They're only here to profit from us. But at the same time, they, people say that these same strangers are trying to steal our jobs. 
as if the foreigner gives us a very welcome outlet for the internal ambivalence under which we already suffer. By internal ambivalence, I mean I am another. Racism would thus accommodate for an intra-subjective problem. It could be a kind of therapy that offers the advantage of giving us control over what seemed without issue. If there would no longer be any foreigners, we would be all right again. We would be undivided, without fission. And this therapy offers the further advantage that it makes that ambivalence a bit less ambivalent, a bit more manageable. For now, the other has a quality that makes him different from me, and, which I, in which I, and in which I can find a reason for my hate and for my aggression. I can say, the other is black and lazy. Or I can say, he is black and he wants to steal my job from me. The intrasubjective problem can thus be projected onto an outside and he thereby becomes intersubjective and hence manageable. In the example just given, one can give voice to two contradictory statements. He's lazy, he wants to steal my job. But one cannot do that at the same time. It takes time to make these statements, or it takes room, place to make these statements. But by taking time and place, it also gives time and place to the one who, of, who utters them. That is, instead of being paralyzed by an internal ambivalence that pushes one backwards and forwards, and hence immobilizes one, the racist can now give himself an attitude. In a sense, he can give himself two attitudes, but not at the same time. The one is contradicting the other, but not at the same time, and hence he gets a certain leeway, yes? Which is perhaps why racism is so efficient as a self-therapy, yes? For Lacan, then, the problem of the ego is not situated outside of it, but inside of it. Aggressiveness feeds on an original intrajection. It is the outside that gives rise to an inside, which it infects with an exteriority that such inside will subsequently try to expel. And this goes against the common understanding of narcissism, of course. The narcissist in common understanding is a person who always already has experienced whatever you want to tell him about your personal experience, yes? And who always takes over the conversation, yeah? Who manages to turn any conversation into a conversation about him or her. <clears throat> and in a sense, that common understanding is Freud's conception, yeah? Closed in on oneself. But Lacan's is exactly the reverse. Instead of having to learn to open oneself for others, in Lacan, the subject should find a way not to be crushed by the other that from the beginning is already inside. I am another. On this conception of narcissism, it would seem that one would have to invert Kristeva's conclusion. Instead of saying what Kristeva says, one would need to say that there are only foreigners because there is already something foreign in me. Yeah, whereas Kristeva says, if, if I recognize the foreign in me, there are no foreigners. Yeah. <clears throat> it is because, it's worse even, it's because foreigners resemble me yeah, and yet are not completely identical that I am constantly at the risk of being drawn into the vortex of a dynamic which is propelled by the I am another, a dynamic of what is necessarily and constitutively, constitutively strange to me. Let me return to the minor differences, if I may. Freud has one or two things to add that may help us understand why it is minor differences rather than big differences that come to irritate us. Let me give an example of what is meant by minor differences. I would, I believe, remain indifferent if the cat is in the bathroom where my wife takes a shower. 
But I would not react likewise, I don't say this from experience, if it were not a cat, but another male. Yes. Unless, perhaps, I would be a slaveholder, and the other person present in the bathroom would be the local servant slave, whose job it would be, like in a novel I'm thinking of, to hand her the warm water she needs to wash herself. In other words, big enough differences are not threatening. A cat, a local servant, a slave are not at my level. I cannot possibly mirror myself in them, recognize myself in them. They fall outside Lacan's imaginary relationship. Such differences are, as Bernard Williams would perhaps call them, purely notional. Think of the samurai culture or Neolithic civilization. I know that these constitute other ways of being human, but these possibilities are out of my reach. They are not a real option for me. They can, at most, arouse my intellectual curiosity, as, for example, when I read the Dalai Lama about death, but they do not constitute a threat. I do not experience them as re relativizing my culture. There is only an intellectual, but not an existential relationship. And this seems different in the case of minor differences. Listen to this passage from Freud's text on group psychology. In the undisguised sympathies, antipathies, and aversions, which people feel towards strangers with whom they have to deal, we may recognize the expression of self-love of narcissism. This self-love works for the preservation of the individual and behaves as though the occurrence of any divergence from his own particular lines of development, and now listen, involves a criticism of them and a demand for their alteration. Yes. Freud continues, we do not know why such sensitiveness should have been directed to just these details of differentiation. But a mere three years before this, he has written a line or two which can help us further. I'm thinking of that opening passage of a text in which he sets out to discuss a detail in the sexual life of primitive races. This detail is the disgust they feel toward women whose virginity is still intact when they enter marriage. These cultures have been very creative, says Freud, in finding means to overcome this quote-unquote problem. Ritual mating, artificial rupture of the hymen, jus primae noctis, and all sorts of other practices that led to the defloration of the brides. Freud even refers to a Roman marriage ceremony described by St. Augustine, where the wife had to seat herself upon the gigantic stone phallus of Priapus. At the beginning of that text, from 1919, the taboo of virginity, in which Freud mentions for the first time minor differences, Freud wrote the following. There are fewer details of the sexual life there are a few details of the sexual life of primitive races which seem so strange to us as their negative attitude toward virginity, the condition in a woman of being sexually untouched. The high value set by our own culture upon her virginity by a man wooing a woman seems to us so deeply embedded and self-evident that we become almost perplexed and feel as if called upon to give reasons for it. So same idea, yes? The otherness of the other has the effect on us as if it involves a criticism of our habits, of our customs. The primitive taboo on virginity does not make Freud's contemporaries doubt the value they themselves put on it. It's not about that kind of easy relativism. But it embarrasses them by demonstrating that this notion, which appeared to be self-evident, was only self-evident for them and not for others. In such situations, Freud says, there is a kind of perplexity that overcomes us. There seems to be something about what is self-evidently our own, like our own culture, 
that we are not or barely able to fully account for. That inability, that confrontation with the apparent arbitrariness of what is proper to us perplexes us. And later, in another text, Freud writes, for example, he relates that perplexity to the hatred of Jews. The Jewish people, he says, are one of those minorities against which larger groups can unite in self-love. The Jews, Freud writes, are different, often in an undefinable way different, especially from the Nordic peoples. And intolerance of groups is often, strangely enough, exhibited more strongly against small differences than against fundamental ones. And a bit later, Freud mentions circumcision as one of these customs, customs which make a disagreeable, uncanny impression on non-Jews. Let me try to sum this up as I see that people are leaving. So what I think is at stake here are two things. The use of the notion, the other in ourselves, yes, is more often than not to be distrusted, yes, because it presupposes a good other. It is possible to develop a theory of that good other, but then one needs, one needs to want to pay the price for that theory, and certainly not do as if that theory is identical with another one. Let's say as if Levinas is the same as Lacan. If one follows not the theory of the good other, but the bad other, yes, as I try to portray here, then a certain number of things that happen in contemporary society become a bit more understandable, as in the example I gave about racism. Yes? It is not just a matter of aggression between people, but the aggression between people is triggered off by an intrasubjective problem, by a problem within the self, yes. And the solution to that problem within the self is not opening oneself to that other in oneself. It would rather seem that one would need a solution that comes from institutions that support us from outside, yes. For example, in the wave of aggression that recently Holland experienced, it would seem that what one would need would be institutions that are really truly public, yes, instead of having a public sphere which is something like a dustbin in which one can utter whatever one wants to utter. Yeah? If you want to call a Muslim, uh, I won't repeat Van Gogh's terms, you should be able to do so and the others should be able to cope with it, yes? So the trust contemporary philosophy puts in psychoanalysis is misplaced. I mean, or the, the use it makes of psychoanalysis is misplaced. This is not to mean that uh, one needs to turn against psychoanalysis, but I think that psychoanalysis points in the direction of a problem that you can render in philosophical terms where the subject has a kind where the selfhood of the subject is a problem for that subject itself. Yes. And where other subjects, truly other subjects, the ones that Kristeva calls strangers, have the unwanted effect. I mean, they do not intend that effect, but the unwanted, unpleasant effect that the subject experiences these problems. This is the situation in contemporary pluralistic multicultural cultures, yes. And instead of pretending that there is no problem whatsoever, yes, we should begin, I think, by realizing that there is a problem and that that problem lies in ourselves and that we cannot, out of ourselves, find the strength to deal with that problem so that the problem is a matter, manner of institutions. And in this sense, perhaps, it would affect a bit the fate of the European Union. Thank you for bearing so long with me. <laughs>